Good morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. What a beautiful day. You know, no matter what the weather is, it's a beautiful day because it's Sabbath. And it's especially nice that fall has come. You know, the mornings cool are in the crisp. Morning. Oh, cool I love evening. that. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, you can tell fall is here. Well, chapter, chapter. <laughs> lesson 14, the last one this quarter. It's a wonderful summary lesson. Ephesians in the heart. Ephesians in the heart. And the memory verse, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, is a longer one, and it makes sense for the summary lesson to have a longer verse to commit to our memories. And as we begin our lesson study, let's invite the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and pray that Jesus will truly be here as we wrap up this Ephesians study. Dear Jesus, we come before you with glad, happy hearts that it's Sabbath. Lord, you certainly knew well how humanity would need a Sabbath to stay sane throughout history and certainly in these last days. We thank you so much. We thank you for the lesson that Dr. McVeigh has provided, has prepared for us to study this quarter. And as we finish, Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will be felt and realized in a powerful way. We pray, Lord, to give us wisdom and understanding that we truly can take these things to heart that we've studied this quarter and truly make this book, Ephesians, in the heart. Your message in our heart. Your life in our life. I pray these things in your precious holy name. Amen. So about that memory verse. Yes. It went back to NKJV for some reason. I have no idea why. I Because it's the one most of us have memorized. Not NKJV. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Right? Sure, go right ahead, dear. And not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. I love that. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, you know, in the Amplified Version, it says that, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do good works which God prepared, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Therefore, <laughs> it's a beautiful picture of, I guess you could say it's truly the summary of Ephesians and the summary really of our journey in salvation you know that we're saved by grace and it's not our works that are going to save us nor is it our works that are going to take us away it's that God is the savior it is not the result of anything that anyone can possibly do so no one can have pride in himself or take glory to himself yeah. it truly is God's truly work. Is, truly is. And, and, and established before creation even occurred. Yeah. It's amazing. I thought this was an interesting um, beginning to the lesson because it talks about um, how often when we look and we say, wow, if I could kind of stand back and look, um, what would I see? It's a, we call it a bird's eye viewer. You know, uh, taking taking a moment to go back and go. Also, a panoramic can, view. Yeah, of of what's there. Being able there. to take in a bigger scope than what you normally do. And it is an amazing view of the plan of salvation of what God really wants um, from us and for us. And so um, Sunday's lesson starts out with being blessed in Christ. This week, my freshman students in Bible class are doing little skits and little things about, about trusting in Christ. But one of the things that one of the boys said, and it took me by surprise, that um, 
when God says don't worry and things aren't going right, we need to praise him. And for a 14-year-old to see that, it's rather profound. And um, so they invite us, Dr. McVeigh, the lesson, invites us to reread um, Ephesians 1. It goes through 1 through 23. It doesn't take very long. I reread all of Ephesians this week because we're supposed to be stepping back and kind of re reviewing this is a good word. Re reviewing. Re reviewing. The I, it's a re review. <laughs> it's a re reviewing <laughs> of what has gone, you know, through Paul's Paul's letter to these Ephesians. What does he see as the emphasis that he wants placed? And I looked at this, and the lesson says it's about the heart. And so let's look at the beginning of this. Um, it asks you to read, and then says, what inspires you? Well, and it goes back because Sunday's lesson starts by saying how people have said Ephesians is the Alps of the New Testament. Well, I've never seen the Alps, but Tracy tells me stories that she has seen them, and she was kind of like, well, these have nothing on the Grand Tetons. <laughs> <laughs> well, somehow I thought they were bigger and mightier, and when you look at them, you go, they're mountains. But in any case, the fact that at, I, I have never been there, but I'm sure the elevation is quite high compared to, and so you have a huge panorama before you. And the fact that Ephesians in the heart, taking it to heart, I think we certainly can sum everything up by saying that this salvation is given to us by God's grace, as we read in the the memory text for this week, Mm -hmm. as explicitly expressed in Jesus Christ. Well, and it's truly his grace. You know, if you look at this... um, that God is is so generous. The generosity of God, I guess, as I looked at Ephesians 1, that's what came through. You know, his benevolence, his grace, his, his planning ahead, understanding and knowing what he wants for us. That is so important to understand what that means and that he wants to not only he hasn't been just in the past generous with us and provided grace and salvation but he wants to continue to work out that salvation in my life and when I I think about that you know Paul has been saying you know you you have so many many blessings here of what God has done for you. And he said, I want you to gather together not Jew or Gentile, not not knowledgeable or not knowledgeable, or not man or woman, not free, not free or, or slave. slave. I, I want you to experience what God is offering in salvation. No matter who you are, Look at what he's offering. Don't you want to be a part of that? And, you know, the lesson finishes Sunday, maybe I'm going too fast here, with Ephesians 1-4 that says, I chose you even before the foundations of the world were laid. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that for a minute, Genesis 1-1 tells us that there was some dark void here. There was some chunk of rock that became earth and habitated. Well... But even before that, God chose. I think it's because he chose his creatures. He chose his creation. I'm not sure he chose me in 2023, um, 7,000 years ago when Adam and Eve were created. But I don't know. Of course, I wasn't around then um, to know. But I, I think maybe Paul is writing here metaphorically that 
God's creations always are part of his plan. And even in his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself to be his own. What's the Old Testament always say? I want you to be my people. I want to be your God. The cosmic chaser. But beyond the salvation of of finding, um, you know, that God has done this for us, he wants to continue to be active in our lives. He wants to be able to say, in your salvation, you have a role to play. And so as you look at that, you need to look at Christ. And then as you develop a relationship with Christ, then you are going to allow him to work the salvation through Christ in your life and again Paul you know as you get to the end of this section you know he often says you know praising God giving thanks to God doing these things with praise in your heart and in Ephesians 1 4 you know Christ chose us but this is the part that I love that we should be holy without blame before him in love. What does that mean? If we are holy and without blame before him in love, that must mean that we've taken on Christ and that what is seen is Christ and not us. And that aspect of it Um, leads us to Monday's lesson where we recognize that it is not I no, it is not I but Christ and when we look at (laughs) predicate nominative dear when we say it is not I it is not I going to have to have a little lesson here later um, you, a lesson will be learned <laughs> yes <laughs> we are all in the same place whether we are Jew Christian whatever we are all in the same place and that we, as human we have we have been dominated by sin we have rebelled against God and so many times people go, well, I'm not that bad. That's not the point. You know, I try to get my students to realize when you steal, whether it's a billion dollars or a penny, you've stolen. It's not the amount. But even it's if you haven't event. stolen, it, we but are all, sin. I know, but we are all sinners. And when we look at what that is for each one of us, we have that selfish part of us that God wants to work out of our hearts. He wants to to have us take on his likeness to um, help us do better. So as I looked at the beginning of this, what does God want? Well, at the top of the lesson, if you're following along in your lesson, Um, on Monday's lesson that first paragraph but God and what do we know about God you know in the beginning God um, we we often have these short things but God and then we get a little lesson in whatever it is that the writer has to teach us who is rich in mercy who has made us alive in Christ who has raised us up with Christ who has seated us with Christ. This is all out of Ephesians 2 and the first 10 verses. Those are things that Christ wants to do with us. I love verse 7 of chapter 2, at okay. least in the amplified version. Mm-hmm. He did not, he did this, and we're talking about uh, raising uh Christ being raised from the dead, Jesus the Messiah, the Anointed One, uh, God, as Tracy you know, said uh, so, uh, so, so well, so rich 
is he in his mercy? Um, and in verse 7, he did, th- did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. So we aren't bystanders. We aren't watching the plan of salvation play out. We are a part of the salvation, plan of salvation. It teaches us to live with Jesus. The uh, document of faith puts out to live in solidarity with Jesus. And be one purpose, to be unified, to be a community of those who are redeemed. But, you know... And to practice doing good. There you go. You got it. I was going to say... it's not a natural practice for us to do that. So yeah. the church gives us opportunities to practice that way. And, and Paul goes on to talk about how you need to be one in mind, but it's one in your love for God, for Christ. Well, and then it in turn goes, can be love to your brothers and sisters within yes. the church. And you can't have the horizontal if you don't have the vertical. If you aren't talking to God, you know, our... our Eagle Rock um, slogan, slogan motto. Well, no, I don't know what to call it. No, it wouldn't it was be a our, slogan or a motto because that's like that's the um, family purpose. Be family, our um, purpose, where we reach in aim, maybe. Yeah, we goal. reach up, reach, reach out, in. reach in, or yes, whichever then, direction it was. But it was. But we I think it was we have about the in up, out, and in, um, where we are taking care of. Not just our family, but we're also recognizing that we have a bigger role to play in society. And basically, when we look at this idea of it, I was thinking that idea of church, the people of Ephesus evidently had had some struggles. They'd had struggles with, oh, well, this is the Jewish law, Mm -hmm. and too bad you're not quite in the Jewish law or maybe a temple and this is for the Jews or synagogue and then and the Greeks and then here's yeah and so we're all early Christians but are we all on the same you know going down the same path and what Paul is saying here is we are one we are in one church one group no outsiders no exiles no migrants no aliens and Jew, so, Greek, Gentile. I guess that would be a Greek, I guess. Yes. Every, everybody but a Jew was a Gentile. They are together. In fact, you know, in, in the, the end verses of, of chapter 2, Paul talks about the fact that at the cross, those were all done away with, the separation. That's why the temple, one reason why the temple curtain was rent asunder love that phrase rent asunder from top to bottom that now Jesus is doing something new he started a new church so to speak he builds something new where everyone all of humanity can be now in God's church the holy temple in the Lord as verse 22 I think ends up with that and if we are living the life that God has called us to live then Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, our memory verse, becomes a path for non-believers or maybe believers that haven't embraced that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, um, where they discover, um, like Martin Luther in the bottom of the lesson on Monday, it talks about Martin Luther and how he went from, um, you know, being a, a Catholic that, you know, was so tied to doctrine and um, the rules of the church and the the way that it was interpreted well, wasn't by the an, Catholic wasn't he church. Wasn't a lawyer first before he became a priest? And I don't remember he was a lawyer, the, but as anyway. a priest, he struggled with this concept of I don't think this is what God is asking me to do. And as he studied, he discovered that we are saved by God's grace. It has nothing whatsoever to do 
with me. And if you go through its 95 theses, obviously we read them translated. <laughs> oh, maybe you don't. Maybe oh. you can speak. But anyway. In Latin, um, perhaps. Yeah. But as you look at this, he, he discovers the reality of salvation as God offers it. Not as we always interpret it, but that we are saved by faith that God's grace is enough. That's huge. By faith that God's grace is enough to save us. And God's grace, his grace coming to this earth, dying for us, living the life that we should have lived. Dying the death that that we should die. Yes. And then recognizing that as he ascended to heaven he took that rightful place again where he was before the fall that man could through him have that kind of salvation and it's a beautiful a beautiful thing and so often we get so caught up in all the other stuff we have to deal with and we forget that it's amazing grace Mm -hmm. Right? It's just his desire to be with us and to have that for eternity. And in doing so, that segue is very nice in the Tuesday's lesson here. I that, did that just for you. No, thank you so much. That in that portion, we become the new church that Christ has, now has built up and established, a new church of the living God. It is a dynamic, growing process that starts in chapter 3 with Paul saying, you know what, Um, here's what went on, but we need to start um, praying for believers, you know, right away. For this reason, because I preached that you are thus builded together, builded together, I, Paul, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for his sake and on behalf of the Gentiles, assuming Um, that you have heard of stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me for your benefit, how the mystery was made known to me and how I allowed to comprehend this by the direct revelation as I already have briefly wrote you. And he goes on. Remember, this is a letter. Which verse are you reading? Chapter 3. Yes, what verse? I just went through chapter 1 through 4. Oh, 1 through 4. Okay. Mm -hmm. So five now is the mystery. Why do we call it a mystery? Is it unsolvable? No. Is it unfathomable? No. Is it not being able to be understood? Is it an unknown? As I was looking at it, and I thought about Paul here, um, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, it's now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is how Gentiles are fellow heirs. As we think about this, why is that mystery now known, but it was not before? It was says it was never disclosed to human beings. It wasn't known to us. It wasn't totally unknown to the universe. Why, why was it unknown? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. No, it was because... We did not see how Jesus lived that life. What it looked like in real time. Jesus lived in that real time. And therefore, as he applied all these laws, all these rules, all these things, he was then teaching, this is how you live. It's no longer... You can look at my life, how I lived it, and you can know this is what you need to do. So Jesus living the life was the mystery that hadn't been actively demonstrated previously. And take that one more step. He then went to the church, the temple, and he said, this is what you think is important. No, let me show you what it it needs to look like. And that is the acceptance of the woman 
who hid her tiny offering as opposed to the Pharisee. Well, just the rich patrons wasn't necessarily a Pharisee. But when you look at um, the life, he said, here is someone who has been a leper and I'm not afraid to touch. Here's someone who, um, you know, you can think of all the stories that go in, and it was to say, I am not my family, my church, believers, those seeking salvation are not just the Jews. Look at what the Jews are doing. And in the end, how they treated him. And he says, yeah, these are the people. These least of these, these are my people. And this is how my church will go forward. I'm sure that just totally winged out the, the priests. And, you know, whether they're Pharisees, Sadducees, or whatever C they are, it's going to have to have just... It had to have really shaken their... You know, because they were proud of what of they those, had. Those rituals and those rites and so forth and whatnot, but... but and the and the hierarchy that they had created, but the very fact that Jesus did not come to reform Judaism, he came to abolish it, really, because he was the sacrifice that everything pointed to. But the leaders of the people had been able to develop so many more things on top of what he gave them in their journey to from Egypt to Canaan mm-hmm. that. It became that became the point of salvation: is the rituals, the washing of one's hands, whether you had water or not before you ate a meal, um, traveling a certain distance on a Sabbath day, having a meal, and now that's your home, so you can continue to travel the distance again, or better yet, travel on water. But if your land was, but if your land, but if your journey was truly uh, landlocked, so to speak, what did they do? They'd sit on a water bottle. So now they're traveling over water. You can travel farther. So it takes less work to glide in a boat than to walk on a walk with a camel. Recognizing that the unity within the church, the unity of all people together, working together, um, practicing their faith, praying together, praising God together. That was going to provide a uh, strengthened stronghold. uh, um, How can I say? Uh, uh, A force to be reckoned with against those powers that were going to act against them. And that basically takes us to Wednesday's lesson where we talk about that unity of faith. What is it that is going to bring us together and help us be strong in the Lord? Well, of course, this is where Paul brings in the different uh, body parts, so to speak, and how they all, for a healthy body, all parts have to be working together. For a healthy church, all, all parts of the church have to be working together. Each church member um, is called to care for each other, each other church member, so to speak. And, you know, Paul says, hey, you know, we're, we're one faith, one baptism, one body, one God and Father. We're bound together by these spiritual realities. We are united, not um, uniform, not... Uh, all little automatons that are cookie cutters, we might say, but we are one, just like our body is, is, is a complex system of complex grouping of systems, but it all, when healthy, all works together for productive life. So I have some students who I say I have a lot of Indian. I, chiefs and not many Indians. I have a lot of leaders and and they're not very good at following. 
And when you have that many, that it, it it's a challenge to work. And every day I pray, God, give me the words, give me the the strength to illustrate what they need to be doing. And, you know, when you look at, at the endeavoring to keep the unity that God has asked us to have, um, I w- as I was reading through... Um, I went back to Ephesians four. So if you look at that, well, that's what we're looking go at. to verse, oh, go to to verse one. Beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I talk to my students about kindness and generosity to other people, even when they're the most annoying in the world. I said, because it speaks about who you are in God. Not It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with who you are as an individual. Are you kind? And if we are called to be Christians, then we must follow Christ. We have to illustrate Christ in everything we do. And I tell them, I do not always. I I know that there are times that I am not doing that. But how could I do that? With all lowliness and meekness. Lowliness. I was thinking about that word, lowliness. I don't know what your Bible says. But lowliness is the idea that I do not see myself any better than other people. And wow, how hard is that? I drive down the road and I think, hmm. And I um, listen to some ridiculous things that my students say. And I go, hmm. How often do we consider ourselves just one? Just one of many. Well, it talks about humility of mind, lowliness of mind, humility and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mind, mind, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another, and making allowances because you love one another. Oh, making allowances. We, in fact, I spent a good deal of time today on this, and I kept going back to the lesson and thinking how can I illustrate this how can I talk to my students and help them understand this idea that that forbearing one another in love means that I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life and to help train a teenager and not tell them what to do is very hard to help them discover it on their own and help them work them around to where they think through and go, oh, I get it. I'm going to have white hair pretty soon. Um, Too late, dear. Eager to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. You have been called to to be one with Christ. And I love verse 7. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. I want you to think about that. I As I looked at that section in Wednesday's lesson, I thought, It's not according to my works. It's not according to how wonderful I am. It's not according to how how wonderful a Christian I am. It's what Jesus chooses to give to you. It's the measure of Christ's gift. And it's and his gift is immeasurable. immeasurable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And And he gives it as it says here, he gives it not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. Yeah. So often, you know, uh, in this section, 
Paul talks about that unity that, you know, when you're immature like little kids, they don't get it. And I totally <laughs> thought about that today. Um, the teenagers have a struggle getting it. Some do and some don't. But what is it that we're looking for that we're supposed to go beyond so that we aren't pulled into the deceit or the... Um, the other struggles that that take us back to that heart and I I struggled with this and I had to ask God on the way home just forgive me because when I get worked up about something it it becomes consuming and it's it's what I want to do and then I think oh God it needs to about be about what you're already working out and it's not about what I want it's about what you're already working out. Why am I not praying that God will continue? That's what that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, I want, I want you to embrace that idea that God wants to work your salvation out within you so that you won't be um, tricked or pulled into deceit or pulled into the the bitterness and that kind of thing. And then we get to um, near the end of, of um, chapter four. Chapter four. And we get the. We kind of get a, a admonition here. Paul says, you know, don't let anything that's. The M5 version says, let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace God's favor to those who hear it I was thinking tonight this How student, often does our speech do that Yeah I'll, I'll I was I, thinking about that. tonight is the is the you know, at this week we've had, um, you know, news, and it comes in news, and and then you know we come to the morning, and it's like they rehash all the news of <laughs> of last night, and tonight they'll do the same thing, morning and noon and night. It seems like they rehash all the negatives of the week, right? And you know, you listen to say a presidential debate that's going on at the Reagan Library, and and you know. Are they being kind to one another, tender-hearted, letting their their speech reflect their the morals they hold themselves to? You know, it's a challenge for all of us. I'm I'm not saying that I'm not without fault, but but we look at our world today, and it's hard. You know, um, I. I was thinking about the the key to loving one another and forgiving one another. You know, in the in the Lord's Prayer, you know, that forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that idea that Christ when he in the parable where he talks about how many times should should I forgive and you know, well, seventy times seven, but Using that as a metaphor of, you know, Unlimited whatever it takes. number. It's a big number. Whatever they, it these takes, These were not educated right? men in general. So yeah. to say 70 times 7 is like, what? That's huge. Well, say that to a fourth grader, it's a huge number. Well, but when you look at it. 9 times 5 is a huge number. But that's beside <laughs> the point. But when you look at that idea, how willing are we to live with language that builds up? And that imparts grace to other people. God says, how can I forgive you if you won't forgive each other? How can, how can, he will love us, but how can you say you love me and then not love others? And Paul kind of wraps up chapter four that way by saying, you know, let everything go. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath. Um, and resentment, quarreling, contentiousness, slander. Um, let all this be banished from you and make 
and, and with all malice and, and of all um, base of any kind. And then the last verse of chapter 4. And become useful and helpful and kind to another. Here's the tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. Used, use Jesus' example as God's forgiveness and how we forgive others. You know, and I really wish that he had tacked on and not just forgive one another, but forget how you think you've been wronged. There's that's the tough part. And well, that's I, so it true sounds, forgiveness, so right? It's, it, truly. So it sounds like maybe the Ephesians had some uh, quarreling going amongst them and had some divisions within the church, their their churches. Something's not going on there. So Paul says, hey, time to get your act together here. I'm so excited. There is one Bible text in this whole lesson <laughs> that um, we could look at. So if you go to Matthew... Five. One of the two that weren't in Ephesians this week, right? Yeah. Matthew 5. We know Matthew 5. It's the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. But we're going to look at 43 to 48. Any idea what that is? Mm -hmm. Before you look? The law of love. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even... The tax collectors wow. do the same. And remember, they were the low of society because they were working for the Romans. If you salute, even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what is it asking us to do? What is it asking? We're going to move into Thursday's lesson where we begin to see. And I, I in the second paragraph... It talked about treasuring others as brothers and sisters. I've always, I don't know how to say this, admired people who talk about brother, sister, brother, sister. Um, It's always seemed to me awkward uh, because I'm, I don't know. I, it's just not my thing. But I admire it because it is a way of of acknowledging that you are part of my family. Mm-hmm. And that idea that we treasure each other. So if we have a curmudgeon who sits down the pew from, from us, am I treasuring? If I have... Somebody who sits and bounces their leg on the floor and it jiggles that. And I think... That's the expensive pew, dear. <laughs> I know. If I... If I... How do I treasure? What does that look like when we treasure someone as part of our family... What does that mean? And so as I continue to read, I thought basically what that means, I will mimic. And this, the the lesson talks about mimicking God's love. It's not my love. I'm mimicking God's love because it's the best I can give. And if I'm mimicking how much God loves that individual, they will know that God loves them because I will be the one loving also. Wow. That's a huge call, isn't it? 
That's an enormous call to us about how do we do that. And so the lesson goes through and looks at um, at the idea of treasuring each other and and spending time and you know being willing to forgive. And then he says, "What does that look like?" Well, let me tell you about how a family should work together. And he does husbands. Here's how you love your wife. Wives, here's how you love your husbands. And he says, as you go through this and you draw closer to me, I want a relationship that's more than that. I want that intimacy with you where we, in our imitation, in our mimicking God, we will lose sight of ourselves and it will be only that we seek to imitate Christ to others. And Paul does that by using the family model Mm -hmm. as perhaps was originally intended here on earth to get better insights into how God's family is. We can establish the family again living in positive relationships with each other. Peace be to the brethren. Um, in every season, the spirit, in any manner, prayer uh, of, entry, of entry. I'm jumping ahead here a bit into chapter 6. But, um, you know, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self. He goes on to say that. And then, of course, 6 starts with the children obey your parents, but then fathers do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Then servants and slaves and so forth, and the bigger community. So it starts with the family and grows out from there. Paul wasn't asking for reformation. Paul wasn't, wasn't saying we need to change society. He doesn't say we need to have a church that the society can see it's different and want yeah. to imitate it as well. Yeah. Don't put on that old self. Put on the new self. Put on the new, um, the new person. So how do you do that? If we're all part of the of the body of Christ, and we are His temple, we are where He comes to worship each day. What does that look like? And then when we are that, then of course we get to the end. Um, of the lesson on Friday where it talks about the armor of God. What does that look like? And why do we have the armor? Well, and it's again, it's not because we don't have someone who's protecting us. The armor of God gives us the ability to truly be used of God in, in the fight against the powers of darkness that this world is truly ruled by. And, you know, I, I love how in earlier last week where we were to not fight the good fight, but fight the battle of peace. Wait, how, how do you have a battle of peace? Oh, peace to you. Let's not fight now. Peace, brother. Peace. But well, what does... What does that look like? And how do we how do we do that? And so when we recognize that we have a an active enemy, and it's not just ourself, but a cosmic one, enemy who is is enemy number one, who wants us to engage in a battle, because that's where his power is. If he can get us to fight He's got us. And that's what part of the thing the armor does is protects us against that that part. As Christ has won the war, we have battles, but the war has already been won. We are waging a war, and it's not a war that hasn't been won, but we are ready to defend 
to stand for Christ, to be a part of that. And then as we look at that, we recognize that victory, the the cosmic victory has been won. Now the victory that we can have in Christ is when we engage with the truth, the righteousness, the peace, the faith, the salvation, and the spirit that is offered in the armor as a way of protecting us where no evil can harm us. And if we allow Christ to give us that armor, to put it on, we will never, we will never fail because God has promised that he will work out our salvation through Christ Jesus. As we finish Ephesians, I, I hope that um, you will go back and read one more time um, maybe today or tomorrow, um, go back one more time and um, enjoy um, the moments that we have with Ephesians, and then we'll be moving on to whole new topics. Well, not new topics, different topics. There you go. Um, in our next lesson, um, hope that you're going to be with us and. Um, we, we pray that God's blessing will be with you. Uh, today, um, we're celebrating uh, Tom's dad's 103rd birthday. He turned 103 in, on, Sept- on September, on the 28th, which was Thursday. Yeah. So, 103. And we're excited. You know, God's given us life, and we are so, so grateful. And I hope that you can find things in your life that are bringing you that joy and uh, the blessings that Christ has offered. Um, Let's pray. You are good. And Father, as as we finish Ephesians, continue to work your salvation in our lives. Continue to work your love so that others will be able to say, I want that God. If that God can be that way in that person's life, I want that God too. Help us to live as imitators, as those who mimic your love so that it becomes so much a part of us that we will reflect all the love and grace and salvation that you offer us today. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the Sabbath. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do have a wonderful week. And as we start the new lessons, we have some more edification in store. Yes. Have a great Sabbath.